Hello, everyone, and welcome to NYCGMC's Pride Celebration. On behalf of BAPA, NYCGMC, the Youth Pride Chorus, and our special guests, the Common Woman Chorus from North Carolina, we would like to wish you a happy Pride, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I would like to first welcome our special guest, Brooklyn-based composer who is originally from San Francisco Bay Area. He was the original composer of tonight's commission at Queer Z, which you'll be hearing the final movement of this evening. Please join me in welcoming Julian Hornick. Hello. Hi, Julian. Thanks for being here with us tonight. Of course. Thank you for having me. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, would you help uh, help our viewers understand what they'll be listening to tonight and give them a little bit of information about your uh, commissioned work at Queer Z? Totally. Yeah. So at Queer Z was a commission uh, meant to premiere in the March of uh, 2020, which went swimmingly uh, <laughs> with the pandemic and all. But uh, but anyway, it's a P the uh, the piece is a sort of exploration of the contemporary queer youth experience, or at least an attempt to sort of create a microcosm of that as a multi movement oratorio. And uh, yeah, and the piece that we're gonna hear, and that I'm gonna hear for the first time too <laughs> tonight, is uh, <laughs> is called Outside Voice, and it's the very final movement in the whole show. Wonderful. Well, I'm sure we'll get to hear a little bit more about that specific movement and the work as a whole afterwards. So I hope you'll join us after for that discussion. But without any further waiting, um, please uh, watch this video along with us as we enjoy it together. Here is Outside Voice.
I know for all of you who are it's watching so cool. who are part of the video, you can't hear the applause of the whole audience, but uh, you're hearing it from me and Julian at least right now. Um, I want to I want to give a huge thank you to all of the singers who performed in this video. Um, for those of you watching who uh, might not be one of the singers, um, you could see them all wearing their headset. Um, they each had to record their voice part while only listening through headphones to um, the other voices that would be singing with them. It's a very different experience. And I thank them all for the hard work that they put in. I, we had the pleasure of having members of NYC JMC, members of our Youth Pride Chorus, uh, members of our associate program with NYC JMC from around the country, and a special guest with, from the Common Women's Co Woman Chorus singers from North Carolina. I wanna thank all of them for all the time they put in to sing on this, one, on this piece. Um, I also want to thank the directors of YPC, Katie Flaffel and Ben Houghton, the director of uh, Common Woman Chorus, Kristen Stinnett, our, our video and production director for tonight, Roberto Araujo, um, our uh, audio producer, <laughs> Lucia Maramba, and our audio engineer, Ed Carlo Arafalis, our accompanist, Aaron Dye, um, and our assistant uh, rehearsal technician, uh, Zoe Peterson, as well as all of our uh, section leaders for this whole rehearsal process. I want to make sure you all uh, know that you have uh, our thanks for being able to produce this. Without any of you, tonight would not have been possible. Um, so thank you all for your hard work. And now we get to hear a little bit more from Julian. Um, thanks, thank you again for being here with us tonight. Uh, we got to hear a little bit about the piece and the idea behind it before we listen to it. Um, and I'd like to start uh, maybe by asking you a little bit more about that. Um, the full work as a whole, you said, is an exploration of the contemporary queer youth experience. Can you tell me a little bit about how that idea came about and, uh, and maybe how you, you just began this process? Totally, but first I do want to say, oh my gosh, that video is beautiful. And as I as I keep saying, but it's, it's still crazy. I hadn't heard that song performed before, so it's still oh, I'm still right. in a little bit of the like post, like oh my gosh, that's what that song sounds like mode because you know I wrote it two years ago and put it away. And oh, I'm and, so you know, glad that, you finally got to hear it. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm just so grateful you did it. It's so cool yeah. to actually hear it as it was meant to be, which is as this wall of sound. But uh, And then actually, sorry, I just remembered also, anyone who's watching right now, we do, this is a live Q&A. You can submit questions uh, if you have any for Julian. Um, there is a link in the description below the video. It will take you to a Google form to submit a question and it'll populate on my screen for me. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Julian, please go in the description box and click the link and submit them so we can get them answered. Amazing. Oh, right, and now I answer. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> totally, oh yeah, so so the piece as a whole uh, came about when the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus came to me, now seemingly a billion years ago, uh, with the idea to do a show uh, about young people and the experience of young people coming out and just being now as queer people. And, um, and it was deeply related to their work that they were doing in the community, uh, in the Bay Area, a lot like your youth course, who I got to meet with a couple of weeks ago and are absolutely incredible and I'm obsessed with them. Uh, and it was so fun to see them popping up in the videos like, oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so that was, that was the impetus was from them. And, uh, and so really the way we went about it was to say, all right, let's talk to as many young people as possible. Let's really, really go in and, you know, get groups together and hear what they have to say. Because, you know, I, I, I'm 26 now at the time I was younger, but I wasn't young enough. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm cusp Gen Z. So to really, really get in there and feel what their experience was like. And even, even more importantly, as a sort of, as very gay, but a gay cis white male, it was sort of this incredibly daunting and sort of insane task. Like, all right, now you, sole author, write about the queer youth experience, which would just be impossible and also an incorrect task for me. And so given that task, the, the way we went about it was to lean as heavily into research as possible and just basically, basically find ways to give voice to what these kids were saying and let them really be the ones telling the story. And then I kind of just got to be the one to set it to music. I see. Can you tell me a little bit about that, uh, that research and that interview process? Um, it sounds like your, your, your role was to create the music through which these stories were going to speak. Can you tell me a little bit about, about 
learning the stories and getting to know the people whose stories these are and how you, totally. what your process is to take that from there to the work that we heard a piece of tonight. Right, yeah. So first, the first thing we did was, or I guess we, I, I should take the credit, I didn't do it. it. There's this amazing guy, Mitch, in San Francisco Game Men's Chorus, who was really spearheading this with Tim uh, in SF. And Mitch put together this basically youth group to come meet and speak with us. And they were incredible and mostly like 14 and 15 year olds, wow. like, yeah, like young, young high schoolers. And, uh, and you know, in all of them in various stages in their sort of journeys. And, uh, and that was, that was the jumping off point, really just sitting down with them for hours and just talking. And, uh, and a lot of the stuff in the show comes from that just first meeting. And, um, and yeah, and then from there, I had some young people I knew who I reached out to and, and sort of like, Hey, tell me things. <laughs> and we, we talked and, uh, and, you know, and then also going into the community and looking at like something like queer youth homelessness, which is so still so pervasive. And so, you know, coming, looking into, I, I was based in New York. So I was mostly looking into New York and the Alley Forney center, and what they do and trying to find a way to put that in the show. And, um, and yeah, so that was that was the jumping off point. And then once once I you know listened for that was really months of the process actually, is months and months of recording and listening and reading. And then basically from that, I had six weeks to sit down and actually try to write the whole thing. And then uh, and then I did. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, thank you for sharing a little bit about that. Um, once. Uh, so it sounds like there was a whole series of interviews and research into what's going on around the country in this. Um, can you tell me now a little bit more about this, the journey that you feel the um, the piece takes us on? I obviously we heard the final movement tonight, uh, and I, I think uh, I hope our audience looks forward to someday when they can hear the full thing live. I know I do. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the journey it takes you on fr up through these stories? Totally. Yeah. Well, it's funny, something that I actually hadn't thought about in a really long time was the structure of this piece as a dramatic work, which I could have no reason to think about over the last few months, but just <laughs> hearing hearing that video, there was uh, like, uh, it just, you know, so there's like, oh yes, I remember how we imagined this would look on stage as this just wall of people that keep flowing in and flowing in. And, um, and to that point, we really kind of envisioned it as a sort of, song cycle or musical-esque thing where at its center were, I think we settled on four, four young people cast from the community, these actual high schoolers who were at the front of the stage and would sort of guide us through the piece and each have these solo songs and, um, and then interact with the chorus behind them in this sort of almost this musical generational exchange type thing that eventually leads us to outside voice where they all stand together in this massive group. And the, uh, my, my high school choir was gonna come on at the end and <laughs> be a part of that. And you see actually get this like, what would feel like this village of people screaming at you from the stage. <laughs> so that, I'm not sure if that answered that exactly, but I. It, it kind of gives us a little bit of a feel for the arc. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We have uh, we are starting to get some questions coming in. Again, if you have any questions, please submit them via the link that's in the description below and the Google form there, and we'll be able to see them. Um, and uh, so you were part of these interviews directly. It sounds like you were you were you talked to the individuals whose stories you set to music, so you could really get a feel for them. Um, totally. So we have a question. It's what what about the experiences of queer youth today is unique. Um, and even they said, even as compared to to your experiences now as a 26 year old, as a, on the cusp Gen Z, as you said, totally, totally. Um, I mean, I and think, I guess this would specifically be from you, from the people you interviewed, from their perspective, from that perspective. Of course, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I mean, from at least from this one group, something that was fascinating, or I guess this one group, and then the sort of satellite groups that I was talking to. So the whatever, whatever my my test group for this was, was you know the the extent to which queerness has, I think, a cultural cachet at this point in certain, in certain places that they would, were picking up on and were therefore able to live more comfortably in, which is not to say that their lives were easy and, and that it was just sort of like blank slate, now we're all out and it's all a party, 
but right. that 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 when I you know even when I was in high school and this was really at the bitter end of the marriage debates when I literally the the month I graduated from high school was the month of the Supreme Court cases and um, and so even then you know I there were there were a few out kids when I was in high school and I was one of them and you know I I grew up in the Bay Area so I had that incredible luck to feel pretty pretty safe and comfortable but I certainly certainly was one alone amongst many and the sense I got from these kids is that there's just a proliferation now of kids who are comfortable even if not declaring anything definitively and of course there's why would they exploring sort of what their identities might mean and not being so steadfast and like no I am this which was very exciting interesting well thank you for sharing that that's very that is a very interesting shift and I'm sure um I'm sure even a bigger difference from from someone who wouldn't be on the cusp and would be a member yeah. of earlier generations um, whose shoulders we stand on building this community that you're talking about that allows that more openness. Right, um, and I think, and I, I do, you know, you have to credit some of that to right. just social media where I think, you know, there, there's, there's such a sort of like radical queer awareness even among like high schoolers at this point that's really shocking and beautiful. And, you know, I think typically would pop up in you know queer groups in colleges and now you know to have to have high schoolers steeped in like theory is just <laughs> awesome yeah it's really interesting um so we're getting some oops we're getting some more here as i'm uh as i'm seeing them come in uh we we've talked a little bit about the going back to the composition for a second this next question is if that's all right um you talked about a little bit about the arc and everything mm -hmm. And tonight we specifically heard Outside Wars, which is, which is the final movement. And I'm wondering if you can, since that's the one we heard tonight, um, if you can talk a little bit about how that fits in to the whole piece and how it might relate to the rest of the work, just so we can kind of understand and put it in context a little bit. Totally, yeah. So yeah, so as I said, Outside Voice is literally the last thing you hear in this whole show. And um, it actually, it was one of the last things I wrote uh, because originally there was another song that I thought was going to be the finale, this song called 28 Barbary Lane, which is still in the show and is now the penultimate work, I think. It's been a long time since I've looked at the run of the show. <laughs> Pretty sure it's the penultimate song. Uh, but, uh, but basically, it was a, you know, pull back the curtain on commissioning and developing. I had written this thing, it's like, look at this very subtle and, you know, beautiful, quiet ending that I've got. And you know, San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus who are commissioning the piece rightfully were like, yeah, very lovely. We like that song, it's beautiful. We need to end up here. <laughs> <laughs> and that song has us here. I was like, all right, that's fair. We're gonna go back to the drawing board, figure out what we got. And uh, and so going back in and, you know, with, with the goal really being like, end big, end loud, and in, some, in something that's gonna leave you kind of floating as you leave the room and hopeful. Okay. And uh, and so the way I ended up going about it was actually effectively inverting uh, another song from the show called Inside Voice. Oh, okay. Uh, and that song is uh, is about this amazing, this amazing kid I met with uh, in our, in our research, who was a young trans boy and um, whose mother was uh, very conservative. And he talked a lot about how like, oh no, no, like I, everything's fine at home. It's fine, it's fine, I'm out, it's cool, it's fine. And then would let, you know, just little little things slip about like, oh, but you know, we just don't talk about it. Like, oh no, you know, just, I, sometimes, sometimes we'll just like stand in the kitchen quietly or whatever. Like they were just clear there was this sort of very subtle tension, which I thought was amazing. I mean, really deeply sad, but dramatically amazing. And, um, and Nick was just so awesome in talking to us about it. But uh, anyway, so I, you know, went ahead and adapted that into this piece, Inside Voice. And uh, and so that song ends up becoming Outside Voice, sim I mean, quite simply by taking the chorus of Inside Voice, which is just don't be so loud, uh, oh. use your inside voice and flipping it. And into this one, which is uh, we will be so loud. Exactly. <laughs> Use your outside voice. I see. Right. I see. 
Well, next time we'll have to do inside voice, then outside voice, if we have to do another digital thing before. Oh, we do beautiful! Voice. Yes. <laughs> no, it is, and it is fine. Inside, somewhat important, you would never guess. Inside voice. Or why would you guess? You have no idea what the song is. Uh, inside voice is written on banjo, and so even the like, even the sort of like the the piano figure that you're hearing, the da dung da dung 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 thing, which works on a piano, actually uh, is based on the guitar or the banjo figure which for inside voice has a kind of twangy, sort of uncomfortable feel. Got and it. then I think when you put it on the piano, it feels much more settled, which felt right for this. It is louder and sort of resonates more I deeply. So, so in actual, in the performance, the inside voice movement would be with banjo accompaniment is what you're saying? Or exactly, that's just how yeah. you compose it? That's how it would be. No, locked. that we, oh, we, yeah. I, I was adamant it had to be banjo. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so inside voice in the performance would be on banjo to this very folky, sort of intimate thing. And then the idea was that by the time we get to outside voice, you let it really soar. I see. I see. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, totally. That kind of leads into another one I have actually here, which is we um, we that I think it comes from how we've talked about the the interviews and the stories that then um, led into that you set, led into the music that you set to music. Uh, it was the question about uh, your composition, your personal compositional process. Um, Cause I don't think mm -hmm. often, audiences don't often get to hear from a, from the composer about how it works. Right. right. Um, and I know everyone's different. So uh, obviously relating to this piece a little bit, but also just in general, how do you get started when you're composing? How do you go from, you know, I don't know, nothing or floating words to uh, full fledged work or to music? Totally. I mean, as, as I've said, like <laughs> repeatedly, but just because I'm a nerd and it's important, research is always the first thing, you know, just as and sort of load up with as much as possible before you sit down to the piano. And then, and part of that is just, you know, a little mic. I, I'd almost always rather be doing anything but sitting at the piano and then eventually finally go, okay, yes, fine. I'm a writer. <laughs> I write. This is, I guess, the thing I do and I sit down. So I said some of it's just compulsion, but some of it is actually, you know, healthy practice. But uh, so I, you know, once I finally research so much that I know I'm just circling something, I'll sit down and I mean, it's real, it's, it's uh, you know, sort of as simple and unmystical as like you look, you look for the hook in the research you have, you find that metaphor for, for outside voice. It was, you know, the, I mean, the outside voice is a bad example because it's using, stealing something else's hook, but for inside voice, it was, finding that idea of the inside voice and what you what you keep inside. And, and then the dramatic idea that in that song, uh, that character is singing while in the back of his mother's car. And um, and so for that song, we, uh, we wrote the song really with this sort of driving motion. And so the dramatic scenario informs the piano figure or the banjo figure informs the hook. So then it, it re kind of, in the way I'm rambling, it actually, you know, is how this works. It just kind of all sort of spills out once you yeah. kind of crack that one thing. And then it's just a matter of kind of catching, catching it on your voice memo before right. it disappears. <laughs> and then going back in and finding what in that initial idea was actually valuable and editing like crazy for a month. Right. And then finally so it's go. Finding that, finding that ra route in almost randomly sometimes or through, totally, a, yeah. through a word from the, from the interview or by yeah. picking up a banjo. Oh. It would be so, yeah, it'd be so nice if it wasn't random. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, again, the, I mean, the banjo thing is great because, you know, I mostly write on piano and this was a song that I couldn't figure out and it was actually picking up that banjo that was the way in for that song. It was, ah. you know, it was what, like so, something about that sound, because I had, you know, had the dramatic incident, had the hook of inside voice, nothing was clicking. And then, you know, just some something something about the way that instrument sounded just sort of clicked and then the whole thing just kind of spilled out in one afternoon. Yeah. And uh, that's not always how it works, but, uh, but yeah, but it's, you know, no matter what, it's always this sort of weird process of just kind of banging around until something fits, which, uh, you know, very deeply academic, my process. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. I know the, the, I know that's the compositional process can be kind of private. Sometimes we don't often get to hear about it. So thank oh, yeah. you for I'm happy share. to blab about it. <laughs> with us. Um, 
We have another question that I, I think I'm going to interpret. I have to interpret a little bit. Uh, uh -huh. It's uh, when, when, and I'm not sure if it's for you or for me. So I'm going to assume it's for you because you're our cool. guest. So <laughs> when you refer to we, do you mean a team of collaborators? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I can't do anything alone. <laughs> it's I, which is you know why I, why I love writing for theater and for for these choral groups because you know I, I if if it was just me in a room forever, it would be so boring and depressing and terrible, which is part of what has been so hard about this pandemic is the only reason I ever do this is because eventually you get to a room with right. all of these people, you get to work with them naked. And so, so that's been hard, but we're getting back. But that, but yes, anyways, it's, you know, I, for this project, it was the amazing collaborators at the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus and my amazing orchestrator, Dan Rudin and Dave, who was helping with the, uh, vocal arrangements. I mean, it was just, you know, you, there's a giant team that helps make these. I, you know, it, it always starts with me alone in my room, jotting things down and banging away. But you know, it's those, those, those little things, those little voice memos are sort of bleh, whatever compared to what ends up coming out when everyone piles on. So there's a team that takes it from, from text and banjo to full 10 movement. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, yeah, yeah. That makes yeah. sense. It's, it's the same thing. And and just to briefly answer the question, any we that I've said tonight is this, is a similar thing. I, I thank yeah. the list of people who had to work together to create the project that you saw tonight. Um, it's the same thing. I think the reason we're in uh, the collaborative uh, media of uh, vocal music and choral music is because uh, it's we want to work with other people. There's always a team involved. Yeah. Uh, no, hundred percent. That's the whole reason. We're coming close to the end of our time here tonight. Um, and uh, again, if you have another question, there's a couple minutes left, please submit it to the link below. Um, if not, we've gotten through most of them. And Julian, I wanna thank you sincerely for your time tonight, for your music. Um, I've had the chance to perform uh, your music uh, with the Stonewall 50th Anniversary Commission, uh, as well as uh, this work tonight. And I'm looking forward to doing more of it in the future. Um, and thank you for sharing some of your process um, and how uh, the interview was and how this came to be. Uh, I do wanna, do wanna give you a chance if there's any other, anything else you want to share either personally or about this project before we leave or a question you wish you had been asked. Um, I wanna make sure <laughs> you, get, you get a chance to tell us how you feel about your music or about oh this work. thank you i mean you know i mostly i'm just so grateful to have gotten to hear any of it <laughs> it's truly it's just you know such a thrill to hear these songs which you know literally was i the day the day i flew to california to start rehearsals for this was the day california shut down wow and so you know, it's it, like march 16th like just and you know <laughs> flew into shutdown and so it's it's this show is forever going to be this weird thing for me of like oh like this little little book that snapped shut, and and to that end, I think you know, I think we've all had this sort of profound experience in the last Absolutely. year and a half, two years. That in so many ways, that's been deeply, I mean, hard but deeply clarifying, and really nothing short of a paradigm shift. And to that end, I think there's something really fascinating as I sort of start to reopen this piece, looking back and understanding it, really almost as a time capsule of the contemporary queer youth experience in 2020 before this happened. Pandemic, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's just, you know, there, there's so much both in, you know, sort of, just sort of a, a cognizance of so many different disparities and the racial reckoning that the queer community has had in, in addition to the world at large, that just makes it, it's sort of, you know, it, it's weird to look at it now and imagine doing it in the same way that it was written. And I think part of what's exciting about the world reopening is the idea of going back in and getting to dig in again and say like, all right, this is what this was. And now now we've had this time to sit and reflect. And sounds, what sounds like be. you might actually even change some things if you went back to it again to perform. Oh yeah. No, I, yeah. I would I would love to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's you know it's but that's also I, you know, I'm the perpetual editor. But uh, <laughs> but it, but now you know now it's it feels like editing with real purpose. Yeah. 
Well, thank you again. I really appreciate you spending some time here with us tonight. Um, everyone who's watching either now or this will stay up on YouTube if you would like to watch it or share it with people later. Um, thank you for spending some of, time, some of your time with us tonight. Thank you for s spending a little bit of your pride celebration with us tonight. Happy Pride Month, everyone. Um, and I hope that you are able to celebrate the rest of the month as, as you wish, as things start to open up, maybe we can celebrate slightly more normally than we have recently. Um, thank you, Julian. Happy Pride, everyone, from NYC, GMC, YPC, our family of associates, and the Common Woman Chorus. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much.